uh, go into the background, into the history of IGF and, and World Summit on Information Society. So how did the IGF emerge? Uh, what were the political circumstances and the context around it? And then we'll try to map what is the mandate of the IGF and what are the stakeholders, which is, by the way, one of the big discussions at the IGF also this year, what are the roles of different stakeholders, starting from governments and with the others. We are not trying to respond to this question here today, but this might be one of the topics discussed during the IGF. And at the end of this day, we will map um, what are the main sessions of today, so that when you go out of this session, you have some rough idea what are the main sessions of the day and what they are going to be about. So you know if you want to visit them or you want to visit some workshops in parallel or something. Tomorrow we'll do quite the same thing. We'll again go through the sessions of the day, but then we are going to try to split into a couple of groups, four groups, thematic groups. So one group will be discussing critical internet resources, which is the main names, IP addresses, and so on. The other one is going to discuss internet governance for development, so access, diversity, and these things. Uh, the third one is going to discuss uh, security, openness, and privacy. And I forgot which is the fourth one, but anyhow, you have it on the website. The point is that we split into smaller groups um, and try to discuss among them our ourselves also with some of the people with expertise in these fields and pose any possible questions that you can think of about these topics. And if you want to change the topic and talk about something else, you just move to another group. So that's the plan for tomorrow. Day three, we'll again go through the main sessions of the day, but then we'll try to play a little bit. Again, not in this environment. Um, we'll try to negotiate on internet governance. Of course, it's going to be a quite a simple or simplified diplomatic negotiations of different stakeholders. But it should give us the impression of what are the relations between different stakeholders, which means every one of you that joined us on day three will basically have his or her own role, like of technical community or business or government of one of the other country, and try to negotiate a deal. On day four, the last day of the IGF, the orientation session, besides mapping the main sessions of the day, will try to bring us more about how all of us can be involved in the Internet Governance Forum after this IGF, which means regional and national forums, capacity building programs, e-participation, which we are building around uh, so that we can basically work on the IGF throughout the year, uh, and many, many other topics. This is, in a nutshell, the, uh, the idea about the orientation sessions. Now, we encourage your participation, and I don't know how to encourage your participation if I don't have the mics for you, but. Uh, We'll think of something. I hope they'll soon bring the mics. Okay, to start today, um, we wanted, as I said, to try to map uh, how does Internet Governance Forum work and what are the different types of sessions, how do we find our place in these four days? Where do we go? Which room? What do we listen to? Who do we listen to? Uh, since, since I don't have the way to get the response from you, I'll ask for your hands now. How many of you, for how many of you is this first time at the IGF? Raise your hand. Great, majority, excellent. Um, the others that are here might help us, that, that have already been at the IGF, might help us to, uh, to share their experiences later. And uh, there is a couple of people here which I will definitely ask to, to bring a little bit of how this should work. But before that, uh, Brian from the IGF Secretariat is with us here. And he, he's the one behind the, sch the schedule, which is so nicely colored and marked and so on. Brian, how would you describe what are the main components of the IGF and what, should, what are differences between different types of sessions and what should people follow? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vlada. Um, I'll just try and give a very brief overview of how the program um, came about. Uh, it didn't come out of the blue. Um, we didn't decide on what we were going to talk about, you know, a week ago. Each year the IGF, this is the eighth IGF, um, and each year the program builds on the previous year. And a lot of the work of the Secretariat, together with the, the MAG, which is the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group, um, 
which is charged with developing the substantive uh, program each year, um, is to uh, reach out to the community and to all stakeholders, all stakeholders, all interested uh, parties, individuals, and organizations about what they want to talk about at each IGF. Um, so after last year's meeting in Baku, uh, we immediately made a call, public call, what went well at last year's meeting, what didn't go so well, um, what do you want to talk about next year? Um, and then we met physically in Paris uh, in February and held an open consultation session um, where everybody was invited to come talk about what they wanted to learn more about, what they wanted to discuss at, the, at this year's IGF. And we began to develop uh, the, the sub-themes and main themes, um, which this year the main theme is building bridges, enhancing multi-stakeholder cooperation for growth and sustainable development. Very broad, but uh, the idea is to give participants a large menu of different topics and items in the focus sessions and the workshops, open forums, um, and other meetings uh, throughout the week so they can learn about anything they want. They can meet um, with other stakeholders, you know, build partnerships, uh, make new friends, and um, get what they want out of the IGF. The sub-themes, um, which will be discussed in the focus sessions and all of the workshops are access and diversity, Internet as an Engine for Growth and Sustainable Development, Openness, uh, Human Rights, Freedom of Expression, and Free Flow of Information on the Internet, Security Issues, uh, Legal and Other Frameworks, Spam, Hacking and Cybercrime, and uh, a, a wide variety of other issues under that category. Um, also this year we are exploring uh, more in depth, though we always discuss these issues at the IGF, are uh, enhanced cooperation, um, principles of both multi-stakeholder cooperation and inter internet governance more in general. Um, so each day, including today, you can come and look at the schedule and participate in um, the workshops and we also hope that you will come to this main hall where the plenary sessions focus sessions we are calling this year will take place. Um, we, uh, the, the workshops, there's more than a hundred workshops and other, and other sessions, so um, we have no way to avoid having some of the workshops going on concurrently while the main focus sessions are taking place. Um, but the schedule does its best to allow um, the workshops that concentrate on the various themes of the main sessions to take place prior to that session so that you can go to a workshop, learn about it, say if it's on a human rights issue um, today or tomorrow, and then on Thursday when the human rights session takes place, you can take that knowledge and whatever you learned at that workshop and come to the focus session and participate actively um, building on that experience that you had. Um, we hope that all of the focus sessions are interactive. There will be panelists uh, and designated speakers, but this year um, we really hope for active participation from the audience. It should be an open dialogue. Everybody is free to speak on whatever issues they want under the themes. Um, in addition, I think we can talk more about remote participation, but that is a huge um, value added of the IGF is our remote participation platforms. Each of the workshop rooms, as well as this room, um, will have remote participation, which enables anybody from around the world who is connected to actively participate. We'll have panelists uh, participating remotely and speaking on different issues. 
um, who weren't able to travel all the way to Bali. Um, and we hope to allow all of you and everybody participating remotely to um, get some real tangible takeaways from this IGF, um, to learn, to share experiences and best practices, and to take them home with you. So that, that's our intention as a secretariat and as a MAG, and uh, we are here to help as well. Um, feel free to ask us questions, and also Vlada and others on the MAG are here to guide you through the process and make it as enjoyable and uh, meaningful as possible. Thank you, Brian. You can move here. We have roaming microphones finally. Um, okay, so about the remote participation, there is one interesting thing that you can also do is you can follow another session from one session. So if you're here, you can follow another session at the, at the same time. Some people do that, believe it or not. I don't suggest that because you can't be focused really on, on, on one of these. You can give it a try. And you've seen the remote participation platform, which also you can share. Um, there is an, it's, it's on the website and so on. So for any of your friends, colleagues here or anywhere else around the world, invite them to join. And as Brian well said, basically um, the idea is that we all get very active about the IGF. So it's not about listening, it's not about observing the IGF, but discussing it. And trust me, all of you know very important bits and pieces that the other do not know. So don't be shy. Just jump in, raise a hand, uh, put your opinion on and so on. Now, I wanted to check with a couple of people that, that had some experience with the IGF. I'll start with Igor. Remember the time when you came for the first time to the IGF? Uh, were you confused? How did you find your way through? How do you find what you want to listen? Hi, good morning, anyone, everyone. Uh, Igor Ostrovsky, I'm also a MAG member, and I do remember the first time I arrived. And the, the main confusing thing was that I thought I'm seeing a lot of sessions that look alike. And I thought that um, there is no coordination um, done on a level of topics. And then uh, later on, only when you look closer, you notice that actually uh, when you see firsthand, yes, there might be sessions that look identical. Um, but when you go into descriptions, you'll see that they describe different angles or sometimes different approaches. We at MAG try to combine sessions or encourage those who submit um, proposals for sessions to work together and to try to, um, uh, let's say, combine topics where possible. But very often we see that um, it makes sense to leave those sessions separate. So it does make sense not only to look at, that, um, at this description, but to click into the IGF website and look in detail about the, uh, the description and the participants, the panelists. Um, so, so although a lot of people might think that there is chaos and that there is a lot of topi topics here, there, and everywhere, there's actually an order to it that I would encourage you to look into. It's not that easy to see the order, but there is an order. That's <laughs> yes, true, yeah? exactly. Definitely. And he mentioned a very important thing is, uh, we, I think we're going to discuss it more on day four also, which is you can impact the agenda of the next IGFs as well. Uh, the point is to, even to, during this IGF, there will be open microphone sessions. You will find them in the, in the schedule. Take a microphone, say what you think, say what should be discussed next year, or even this year or between the two IGFs. Um, Brian, do you want to add anything about this, this part of building the, the, the program and, sure. and other things? Quickly, also, uh, refer to the IGF website homepage. Uh, we agree it's not perfect, but there you can find all the information you need about uh, this week's program. Uh, the program paper, um, which you will see there, outlines the, the, the entire preparatory process and the different sort of sessions that will be taking place. Uh, the session notes are the detailed agendas of the, all the events that are taking place in this um, main hall throughout the week. Um, and the schedule, uh, which is printed that some of you have here already, um, has actually been updated since this was printed. So make sure you refer to the schedule that's on the website um, throughout the week to get the most updated information. And that organizes all of the events under the various themes so that you can find um, what you want. So.
that's a, a good, important reference to have. Thank you, Brian. Any questions from any one of you? Anyone who has been at the IGF wants to share the, shortly the experience of managing through the, the schedule? Nena. Thanks. Hi, people. As Brian was speaking, um, I want you to look at this. Um, if you can read, I'll read it for you. It's Master Program Sheet Nena. This is my IGF in the IGF. Um, the thing, like they were saying, is that you can get in here and get lost. So you must follow up. Um, the most important thing is that you know where you're going and how you're going about it. So between, actually, I have local travel, check-in in Abidjan, airbound. Um, I have all the dinners. I have all my lunchtime planned. I know where I'm going, and it's fixed. And I know when I have free time. So I just want to share that with everyone. Um, it's still day one today. So you can sit down and make your own program and know where to be. You must check to know if the rooms have changed. You must keep updated and um, arrive before time. Don't go in very late so that people do not overwhelm you. So my, 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 the experience I'm going to share is be prepared. Make a program for yourself. And the other thing is, check the list of participants and know nice people you want to hang out with, you want a photo opportunity with, and just people you would like to meet. If you would like to meet me, hey, come on up. Thank you, Nana. <laughs> yeah, but this is serious. I mean, the, the IGF requires for all of us the preparation to know what we want to do there. And one of the worst things about the IGF is it always happens at these so nice places. But you're so overwhelmed with activities and things to do, especially if you prepare and so on, and you don't want to break your schedule, your own one, and so on. But you should find that some time for, for fun as well. That's, that's also true. Any other comments about the experiences of the IGF or any questions from the newcomers about the types of the sessions, what you should listen to, and so on? You can raise your hand even after if you, if you think of something. If not, then we'll move to the next part, which is um, going through how the IGF emerged. So what happened at the World Summit and what was the political context of these times? And then we'll try to listen to a couple of different stakeholders, but also some of you. What are the positions and what are the, uh, well, basically the, the positions of the stakeholders about different issues and so on. Uh, Jovan, you were involved in the WSIS and, and working group on internet governance since the beginnings. How would you? <laughs> Great fun. You haven't missed any IGF, no? Or you have? You have missed some IGFs. IGF in Brazil, in Rio. You missed the Rio experience. Share with us. Okay. Thank you, Vlada. Good morning. I just realized that I cannot invite uh, Nena for lunch these few days. She's overbooked. Uh, it's great to uh, meet you all. Um, and uh, as Vlada suggested, I will try to squeeze ancient history of the IGF and versus in about five minutes. And it's a part of the, my life story uh, when I... Uh, joined the first uh, versus an internet governance. I tried to explain working group on internet governance and Wolfgang was at the group as well. I tried, tried to explain to my wife what I was doing and she said, well, that's very, very strange. And then I tried to explain to my friends and uh, they said, Jovan, uh, my printer doesn't work or I get new software, can you come to install it? That was the awareness about internet governance 10 or 15 years ago. Now it has moved and now people are asking more reasonable questions. But on a more serious note, uh, let me just give you a quick survey of what has happened over the last, let's say, 30 years. As you know, IG started bottom-up with academic and professional communities in the United States. It was a, a, a sort of circle of engineers with a very uh, relaxed way of governing the, uh, at that time the internet, very early internet. Uh, later on, uh, the first complexities were introduced, mainly DNS. I'm now simplifying, not oversimplifying. And they needed some sort of governance. There was some sort of loose structure started appearing. And in the 90s, internet started becoming important academically, uh, economically. And the first elements of the need to more serious governance were, 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 uh, were needed. And in the late 90s, you have the uh, whole development about ICANN. ICANN was established 
as a, some sort of early DNS battle between this early internet community, business community, trademark community, and various players. Now, what is important for us, for IGF and World Summit on Information Society, governments realized in the late 90s, early uh, uh, beginning of our century, that something important is happening in this field of the internet. And they started moving into the internet, early internet governance discussions. This was one process. The other process was, if you can recall, in the 90s there were many conferences, conferences on population, Rio conference on climate, uh, on the sustainable development. There were conferences all over, there was Copenhagen on the, on the uh, what was Copenhagen, on the human rights, a Cairo conference on the population. There was, there was some sort of fashion of organizing major UN events. Therefore, ITU came to the, uh, to the idea, the, the Minneapolis uh, Plenipot meeting, to organize conference on the ICT. And this is how the idea for the World Summit on Information Society came into, into, the, into, into the reality. The first summit was organized in 2003. It was a unique summit because it had two events, a Geneva event in 2003 and a Tunis event in 2005. Therefore, during these two events, internet governance emerged on the diplomatic agenda. Previously, it was completely hidden. Therefore, 2005 in Tunis, uh, there was some sort of Tunis compromise between two views, which are still, uh, um, existent, uh, uh, still existing today. One view that internet should be governed through mainly um, non-governmental um, processes, or later on multi-stakeholder processes, and the other view that internet, like any other issue, climate change, migration, should be governed through intergovernmental process. Therefore, inter uh, Internet Governance Forum was created as a compromise between these two views, and the part of the compromise deal was that it is part of the UN, it is organized under the U UN umbrella, but it is not typical UN process. It is a multi-stakeholder, very informal, very bottom-up process. And this is uniqueness of the Internet Governance Forum. Both uniqueness and also weakness in the way how it, is, how it is managed. Therefore, you have a challenge and you have risks. And this, you should keep in mind when you are analyzing, when you are following what's going on in the Internet Governance Forum. Therefore, this is inbuilt element in the, in the architecture of the IGF, that compromise between two different views. We have had eight IGFs. In the meantime, what was happening in the real life, uh, th there has been enormous explosion of the of internet governance developments. We got Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, um, almost two billion users. Now the key question that we have to address, not only at this IGF, but this year, the next year, is what is the suitable governance structure that should support this enormous development? In order A, to facilitate future development, not to constrain, and B, to protect public interest and to have a proper role for governments and other public institutions. Therefore, we are in a way revisiting Tunis discussion about this compromise, but in different contexts. Therefore, this is a short history, a short ancient history of the Internet Governance Forum, and also background for understanding where are we now and what is underlying theme to discussion that we will be facing? Because you will be, you will be following many discussions, but you should also know what is the underlying dyna dynamics and what is the history, how we came to this point today, and how this, all discussions are influencing what we will be discussing at the IGF next three days and throughout the, this year and the next year in trying to shape the future Internet Governance Forum. And we should keep in mind that that new architecture should keep vitality and what is good from the internet governance since, uh, f since its early days. The open, uh, open process, bottom-up process, involvement, creativity, while adding this layer of protection of the public interest uh, in uh, its various forms on national, international level. Thank you, Johan. Um, when we are talking about uh, the... Uh, oh, you can just leave the mic. Side. Uh, I think Peter has a microphone already. Uh, when we're talking about the, the, the IGF, uh, some people, I hear it often, well, they say the IGF is not a negotiation 
negotiating body, so we can't have anything out of it. But we have a bunch of people which are just gathering and talking about and so on. Uh, and this dialogue between, between uh, uh, stakeholders, I, I figured out after a number of years that in fact this is a negotiation. It just lasts for much longer than sitting around the table and negotiating the paper. But I think Peter has, has a lot of experience with, with this kind of multi-stakeholder negotiations, not only within the IGF, which is a long process, but also with the, within the Commission for Science, Technology and Development of, uh, of UN, uh, which is in a way in charge of deciding on the future or on possible reforms of the IGF and so on. Uh, Peter, what are your experiences? Why do we meet here? Is it just a traveling circus around the world or? Good morning. Uh, why, why do we meet here? I don't know, probably it's dedication, uh, adventure, uh, experience. Uh, I, I would think it's, it's a unique experience. When I, the first time I came here, I was just amazed. Why? Because uh, uh, the uh, approach we are having here is completely different whatever you may experience somewhere else meaning that you can approach some ministers if you wish to, you can approach uh, uh, parliamentaries, you can talk to CEOs, whoever. I mean, on, a, on an equal footing. So this is a unique opportunity for you to, to do that. Now, uh, I, I think uh, there's some truth in saying that in spite of the fact that it's not a negotiating forum, uh, we are still negotiating. We are taking inputs from all stakeholders, and it's extremely valuable. Uh, in a negotiating environment, probably people start uh, talking uh, in a very uh, United Nation-like language, uh, which sometimes doesn't really convey the real meaning. Here, it's more relaxed, and you can have the real information, how people think about different issues, and there are a lot of issues. Well. Uh, to, to make your life a bit harder, uh, after all this information you have received up to now, uh, I would like to add some more. Though I, I have been told that uh, in a good presentation you, you can't concentrate on more than three items. Uh, and up to now I think you, you have already had about 10 or 15. So I don't want really to increase the confusion, but it has been already said that in some way uh, the, uh, it is under the umbrella of the United Nations, IGF itself, though it is apart from the United Nations. However, it has already been said that as for the future of the IGF, it is the United Nations who is going to, to have its final say. Why do I say so? As you know, this is the eighth event of the IGF. We have started in 2006. Uh, there was a renewal of the mandate, which was for five years. And this is the second five year, and we hope that the, the IGF is going to continue beyond 2015. 2015 is the magical year where we have a kind of review of the whole process, including IGF. Uh, there has been some mention of the World Summit of Information Society. We are going to have the 10th anniversary of the World Summit of Information Society in 2015, meaning we are going to have this evaluation and uh, hopefully the renewal of the mandate of the IGF, which is going to continue. Uh, having said that, whatever the outcome will be of the review, we know that the IGF is uh, uh, something which has uh, contributed to other processes uh, on the national regional level as well. So uh, you may hear about national and regional IGFs uh, which are flourishing and you have it everywhere. You have in the Asia Pacific, you have in the States, you have in Europe, in Africa, in different parts of Africa. Uh, so uh, the IGF, whatever the, the issue, uh, the outcome will be of the review process, is going to continue, but we hope that the global one will be also renewed. So uh, uh, just as a uh, conclusion, I really recommend you to make use of your stay here, not only going to the beach, but uh, as well approaching some people you may never have opportunity 
uh, in your private life to approach. So this is something extraordinary, and I'm always fascinated when I come here. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Note the special emphasis not only to the beach, which doesn't exclude the beach, right, sometimes. Now, when we are talking about this process, uh, Marcus Kummer uh, from the IGF Secretariat is here with us. And uh, the question is, now we see uh, the flood of events around the world. We have seen the cyber conference. We're hearing about uh, the possible new conference in, in Brazil next year. There is a number of fora. Why should we choose the IGF? Or should we choose just the IGF? Or how, why should we be here and contribute to the IGF? Uh, small correction, not secretariat anymore. <laughs> I used to be, but now I'm interim chair of the preparatory process. Well, I think Peter gave the answer to this question to a large extent. Let me face you guys. Uh, on the one hand, there is a link to the United Nations. The meeting is held under the auspices of the Secretary General. The Secretary General of the United Nations convenes the meeting. That gives legitimacy to the meeting, to many countries who, for instance, uh, fail to see legitimacy in any other meeting when it's not convened by the United Nations. And at the same time, the IGF is as open and inclusive as possible. Anybody who has a legitimate interest is welcome to participate. And this is more than most other meetings. Now, the IGF is not an uh, operational meeting. People don't come here to solve problems, but they come here to exchange information, to share best practices, and to share their experiences. And they enrich themselves, they learn something, and then they can go home, back into their own organization, in their own country, and implement what they learned. And I heard stories like that. The people went to a workshop, learned about how to set up an internet exchange pond, went back to their island in the Pacific Ocean and set up an internet exchange point. So this is an indirect impact, but it is important. And Peter mentioned the spread of all the national and regional IGF type meetings uh, in countries where before they didn't know how to interact between different stakeholders and all of a sudden they interact and they have participatory processes where they solve their own problems. And that is something that has started from the IGF and I would call this a not negligible impact. Yes, of course, there are many other meetings, but... Uh, I would say the IGF is sort of the annual watering hole for the community when you can come and learn from each other, learn what's happening elsewhere. And I heard that from government regulators. I cannot go to all these meetings, but I like to go to one meeting a year, and the IGF is the meeting where I get my annual update of what is happening. So this is my short sales pitch. Thank you, Thank you Marcus. Uh, the, confusing, the confusing thing about this, we mentioned that this is a process which provides a lot of exchange of information, but it's also kind of a, on a long-term negotiation process about the future of the Internet. But then we have a bunch of different stakeholders. And this issue about stakeholders and what are the stakeholders and who are, so to speak, the legitimate stakeholders or not, or who do you represent and how, is, is quite an open question and discussed around. I wanted to check with you now again. Um, how many of you represent civil society here? Or feel like you represent a civil society? Okay, quite a number. Uh, government? Any government representatives? Okay. You're grouped somehow over there. That's interesting. Uh, business or corporate sector? Couple of. Probably the fewest. Okay. Technical community? Some, some are raising the same hands, I see. Okay, that, but that's, that's good. Many hats. Yeah, so, some wear many hats. Is there anyone who is coming from the media as a kind of a, a TV or journalists or bloggers or something like that? That we can say the media? One, two, you have many hats, Nena, three. Okay. So academia, for instance, uh, the universities, research centers and so on. Researchers. Researchers. 
Okay, so there's a number of hands. So I see most of the, I mean, many of you do, have, do wear a number of hats. So how do we really say what are the stakeholders and then understand their needs and their interests and their positions and so on? Yesterday when there was a high-level meeting, it was very good to see that we have different stakeholders on the main panel on the high-level meeting. You know, I was a little bit maybe uh, not surprised, but uh, I thought it should be mixed and not have one by one the government and technical community and business and civil society, but I'll, I'll mix it now here. And I'll start from, from corporate sector, for instance. And Tero is here with us, who is representing the business sector. So Tero, why are you here? I mean, you, the business people. What do you find interesting in, in IGF? Except the beach. Except the beach. <laughs> OK. Uh, so very good morning for everybody. I'm, <coughs> I'm Tero Mustola from Nokia Corporation in Finland. And um, pity I, I was trying to say the beach, but, but Vlada took that out. Anyway, why to be in IGF and why, why business is present in IGF? I think it's that we feel that we are part of the, let's say, the multi-stakeholder community, which has been actually repeated already this morning many times. And I, I'm afraid you hear the same word many, many times during this week. But um, then maybe some words, what is the business or which is also called as private sector? In, in some of the documents and uh, I guess in some of these meetings during this week. So uh, naturally, uh, business is the big corporations uh, like the IT companies, the internet service providers, the mobile operators, uh, vendors for those companies like our company. But it is not only this side, it's all, also the smaller companies, all the companies who make e-business which I think everybody here also know and, and have been working with, and including each and every small business. In our, now, nowadays, if you think about the uh, internet and, and some kind of business, you can't actually do any business if you are not present in the internet. Almost everybody has own website, at least, if not having any, any, let's say, e-commerce or anything like that. So it's, internet is nowadays really part of all economic activity. So we feel that, that the business or private sector has the role here. And, and we really believe on this multi-stakeholder model. So to have everybody with, the, with the equal footing have the possibility to discuss and exchange ideas with the other parties and, and because this is the way we increase the understanding of the issues. The issues in internet are, in many cases, they are complicated. They may have the regulatory aspects, but they also have the technical aspects and business aspects. And, and to be able to evolve the internet, we need the understanding of all these sides. Then just a couple of words, how, how actually the private sector in ITF is organized we are very much organized around the International Chamber of Commerce, ICC, which has a special group looking after all these internet governance issues. And naturally, it's open to all the, the businesses and ICC members. And, and really, this is the group in, in the business community who is trying to focus and, and take care of these issues and take the responsibility to be part in the, in the ITF discussions. Thank you, Tero. Uh, remember him, so if you see him on the corridors and you need to get linked with someone from the business society or ICC or whatever, uh, you can always approach him. I'm sure he's, he's going to help. Yes. Hello, good morning. Um, my name is Ana Lucia Lenis. Um, I'm the policy counsel for the Andean region in, in, for Google. Um, so I just want to add some uh, comment about the idea of uh, private sector. And sometimes when you think about what means private sector or the companies, people think in the big companies. But uh, I think it is important to think about the small or the local entrepreneurs that we have in our own countries doing businesses online and how the regulation will impact the uh, development of these local businesses in our different countries. So sometimes uh, uh, I'm trying to 
uh, to have conversations with this group of local entrepreneurs that are working and doing a lot of amazing applications, local content in our countries, and maybe they should be involved in this kind of debate in the future. Thank you. I think this was, this was really a, a good, good comment that usually we really think about business, the big corporates and so on, which is included, but it's not only that, of course. Uh, so it's important that, that small and medium enterprises and entrepreneurs are also involved in this. Now, moving on to civil society, for instance, and Wolfgang is with us. Well, you're also the academia. You also have two hats. Um, I'm interested, uh, to one extent, talking about the business and civil society do have a lot of different positions about the IG in many issues, but on the other hand, they cooperate a lot for fighting for multi-stakeholderism and so on. So why, are the, why is the civil society here, and do, do we really think we can do something here? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vladimir, and good morning to everybody. Um, indeed, all the stakeholders involved, all the four stakeholders, technical community, civil society, governments, and the private sector, have a different profile, but they have something in common. And nobody today can act against the interests of others. So that means if you want to have sustainable results from a process, you have to have the involvement of all stakeholders. No one stakeholder can make decisions by disregarding the interests of the others. This is the result of an interesting process. And I just want to add some historical remarks to what Jovan, uh, in a very brilliant way, outlined, because he went back to the 90s when we had a lot of these uh, world summits. I was involved in the World Summit on Human Rights in 1995 in, in Vienna, where this summit was a poorly intergovernmental meeting, and all the civil society and human rights groups were in a separate building in the basement, and they had no access to the intergovernmental negotiations. So that means you had different badges and there was a, you know, a counter and you could not go to the real negotiations. That means you could make some noise in this basement, but you had no access and no impact to what happened in the big room. When the mandate for the World Summit on the Information Society was drafted, I think governments realized that they cannot do it alone. And they started with this experiment to have the World Summit on the Information Society uh, also open for other stakeholders. But then in the first phase in Geneva, it started that the governments had no clue how to treat these other stakeholders. It started, with, do they have access to the room? So after the opening ceremony in Geneva, the civil society people and the private sector people were removed from the room outside and said, now it's an intergovernmental thing. Then civil society people knocked at the door and said, you know, why you exclude us? You know, we, we want to listen what you are doing and we want to have our own contributions. We want to have a say. And so step by step in the WISIS process, uh, we have, were able to broaden the so-called rights for civil society and participation. It started with access right to the rooms, to the plenaries, then access to the working groups, then speaking rights, and, you know, we not ended up with negotiation rights. That means when the final texts were negotiated, this remained in the hand of the governments. But civil society people were in the room, and this has changed the picture dramatically. In the uh, WIGIC, Jovan was a member of it, and he reported a little bit, the Working Group on Internet Governance. We saw at the early beginning that there were two different approaches by governments and by the rest of the stakeholders. So... Um, while the governments could not agree on the oversight function. So the idea of the ITF to have a stakeholder, a multi-stakeholder, uh, let's say, forum, um, this was able, we could agree. So that means uh, to um, have the Internet Governance Forum as it is today is the result of a process, by the way, which was initiated by civil society, if you go back, to the records in 2002, the Civil Society Internet Governance Caucus proposed something like an Internet Governance Clearinghouse. So, and over the years, the Clearinghouse idea, you know, was developed into the Internet Governance Forum. So that means this Internet Governance Forum, from a civil society perspective, is a huge achievement because here, civil society groups, 
can participate on an equal footing. So they are sitting next to a minister, next to a CEO from a private uh, corporation or to technical people. There are no differences. That means you have a voice, you can express uh, whatever you want, and you can, let's say, argue for the interests of the constituencies you are represent. Certainly civil society priority are human rights, freedom of expression, privacy, freedom of association. These are uh, questions like uh, capacity building, access, uh, you know, development, sustainable development, education, training, all these are the priorities for civil society. This is certainly also in the interest of the other stakeholders. So, but you know, the, uh, the civil society has to play this special role by fighting for, or by arguing in favor of this special values. Uh, certainly the civil society is not the only band in town, like governments are not the only band in town. And you will have sustainable results only if you listen to all uh, uh, voices and then come up you know, with a balanced solution which takes into consideration the civil society um, um, interests. In particular, what I mentioned already several times is human rights, education, access, capacity building. And let me add, you know, one thing to the beach because you have uh, mentioned this several times. I think it's interesting to understand the architecture of the IGF because this mirrors a little bit the ar architecture of the internet itself. So the internet architecture is that you have in the middle the root server, then you have the name server, then you have the servers, and but everything is based on the end-to-end -end principle. So that means the power, decision-making power, and all the knowledge is on the edges, not in the center. I would not say uh, that the, uh, let's say, main sessions are like the root servers. They give you just the orientation. They give you, you know, where to go. You go to the name server. And name server are then the workshops. And in the workshops, you know, sometimes you get the inspiration that you see, now I have to go to, you know, a very concrete um, server, you know, which handles finally my email or uh, my request for a website. And this very often happens on the beach because um, that uh, you talk to people, you know, very ad hoc meetings. So that you meet some people and say, okay, you share um, the same ideas, you know, I have. Can we do something? Can we produce something? And a lot of things which happened in the last 10 years are the result of this end-to-end -end communication. So that means the value of a network is, uh, you know, driven by the number of the members. Here you have nearly 2,000 uh, participants. That means you have chances to talk to 2,000 people. If you multiply 2,000 with 2,000, then you see, you know, the tremendous power this communication has. That means do not concentrate your activities only on the main sessions or the workshops. You know, all the coffee breaks, the lunch breaks, the dinner tables, they are important part of the whole discussion process. Certainly after four or five days of communication, you are totally exhausted, but then you are also excited. And the IGF is still a big excitement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wolfgang. It is true that, that uh, there is a lot in, in personal contacts and as the diplomats also say, the corridor talks probably uh, one of the most important parts. Um, what, I'm, what I'm quite happy that, uh, to, to, to see is that also the uh, Brazilian ambassador Fonseca is with us today. And uh, this is a perfect moment maybe to ask about um, um, why do the governments come here? So basically... Um, uh, we know that, that the governments have a number of different fora where they can show up, but still most of them, well, more and more of them, we hope, join the IGF and work at the IGF. Uh, why is that so and why the governments basically, basically wish to be involved in that? Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, in a very short answer, I would say that we view IGF as a meeting point, a meeting point of people, of ideas, and a place for cross-fertilization of, of ideas, exchange of information. My government attaches uh, value to IGF. We see IGF performing a function, a role that is not uh, fulfilled by any other institution we have. 
Uh, and actually, we have hosted the second IGF in 2007, and we are proposing ourselves to host uh, IGF 2015. So my, the attachment of the Brazilian uh, government uh, in the appraisal for this exercise is uh, very firm. Uh, I'd like to also to touch on one point you mentioned before, which is the relationship between IGF and other processes regarding internet governance. And just to confirm uh, that from our point of view, all those processes are very important. Uh, at this very moment, we are discussing within the General Assembly context on, on how, uh, whether there will be a high-level event in 2015 or late 2014, for an overall review of the outcome of the implementation of WISIS, uh, marking the 10 years of, of WISIS. So this is a very important discussion for us. Uh, of course, we also have the working group on enhanced cooperation within CSTD, which is also a very important process we want to pursue since we, in our view, and we know there are different views, uh, the concept of enhanced cooperation has not yet been fully implemented and this is something we want to discuss also with all uh, partners, uh, stakeholders, how we can move forward in that direction. Uh, I would mention there are a variety of other fora. Uh, indeed, uh, I just read a figure that there are over 85 uh, processes for dealing with internet governance, and we, we think each of these has a, a, a particular role and we attach importance to all, all of them. Uh, in synthesis, we think IGF also represents and may be the seed for a new paradigm of international cooperation. Uh, as a professional diplomat, I'm used to go to meetings and as you have said, we have, uh, I worked at the UN in, in New York, so the, the kind of meetings we have there, we have intergovernmental discussions at the, at the end of the session you have maybe five or ten minutes in which civil society representatives come forward and and make their inputs and it's a moment in which most decisions have already been made and the those interventions are I would say even hardly heard because people are already doing something else and finalizing the reports so it's not let's say the the UN traditional context which has of course its value its its importance, uh, I, I think, is not fit for Internet. This is something that we are convinced as a delegation. We have been doing this internally in Brazil, uh, the Brazilian Steering Committee, which oversees uh, uh, the daily operation of Internet, is a truly multi-stakeholder model. So we are very comfortable in uh, endorsing the concept that at the international level regarding Internet, we also need a new paradigm, and this would be the mood stakeholder model. How we can uh, draft and have the outline of this is, of course, a very complex exercise because we are talking about different cultures, I would say, the intergovernmental process, the uh, uh, self-regulatory agencies process. So it's not an easy task how to reconcile uh, this and, and to draft uh, a structure that will allow uh, at the same time to take into account governmental concerns and to have significant uh, input and participation from all other stakeholders. But this is an exercise that I think IGF, as I, as I have said, is a seed for that maybe. It shows a way. It, it has been highlighted. It was born within the UN context. So uh, I am very optimistic that since that has taken place within the UN, we can be creative enough and bold enough to engage to new forms of cooperation. And my government is fully prepared to, to embrace this and work with all other governments and stakeholders to that end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you for, for the encouraging speak. Um, I think it's really important to hear from, from the governments which do have some experience, and Brazil is one of those who has the experience also on the national level about the multi-stakeholder model. So I'm sure we can learn a lot from, from Brazil and many other cases. Uh, we have uh, Ana Neves with us also, also, who is from the government of Portugal. Um, and Ana, what would you say? I don't know, the mic is somewhere over there, or I'll give you mine. Okay. Uh, Ana, how do we get more governments involved, or do we have en enough governments at the IGF? How do we get them more involved, and, and why should the governments be here? Uh, 
Uh, hello, good morning. Um, well, I think that governments are not fully engaged um, on, on this movement. Uh, it's a pity, uh, but they don't understand this process. It's not working? Ah, okay. I should talk like that. Uh, so, I, I was saying that the governments, they don't understand the process. So, um, they are not fully engaged. Uh, we have several countries here, of course, but uh, as the Brazilian ambassador was, was saying, there are a lot of um, indefinitions, lots of things that for the governments, uh, it's a bit to waste their time to be here. It's not the case of the countries that are fully engaged at ICANN and uh, ITU processes and uh, United Nations processes and more that and they want to understand what internet policy is and what means uh, internet governance. So these countries that want to understand what internet governance is, these countries, they are fully engaged and they have to be here because it's not only the technical community, it's not only uh, the civil society uh, that will change the paradigm. We need the government to change the paradigm even if you don't want the government to make rules um, and standards and other things, you need governments to make aware all the society that internet governance should be a multi-stakeholder process and why and what does that mean and who, who are these stakeholders and how they should compromise and how they should compromise with the government and um, this dialogue has to be made at national level, regional level, and international level. But still, uh, the voice uh, of the governments is not well heard here, because does it make sense to have a minister here today? For me, it would make sense. But for the ministers, it, it does not make sense because they will be w wasting their time. Y yesterday, we had a high-level meeting with ministers. Well, ministers, they, they stayed for the, for the afternoon uh, uh, workshops. They were involved in the, in the discussions. No. So it's up to the, to the public, to, 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 the, to the civil servants, as, as, as I am, uh, uh, to, uh, to do my job and to go back home and to explain, explain and explain and to organize uh, uh, different meetings involving uh, all the stakeholders I think that are needed in order to engage governments. So I'm not defending the other stakeholders because I'm from the governmental side, uh, but uh, I think there's a problem of governmental uh, engagement here and there's a lot of misunderstandings as well and when we can surpass these misunderstandings then internet governance will be much easier and our 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 path will be uh, much more smooth and we can really discuss what we should thank you Anna I think it was, it was really precious to hear that, that it's not only about the ministers. When we talk about the governments, we usually want to see only the ministers, but it's not only about them. It's a lot about the structures beneath the ministers that should basically convey the message and bring the whole process into, into uh, discussions on local level. Thank you, Anne. Uh, the, the last, so to speak, the last stakeholder, and then we close this part, we are coming close to the end of the session, um, is a technical community. And if I remember correctly, the technical community was not initially mentioned in, in uh, Tunis agenda, but was added later on. Uh, but it is really dominant because we have uh, all these acronyms, TCP, IP, and uh, IXPs and so on, and we don't really know what that is, but the technical community does. And then on the other hand, we have, of course, CSTD and the IGF and the ITU and so on, which are the political bodies. A lot, a lot of acronyms, hard to manage. We even had to prepare a, a glossary of acronyms for people to, to be able to follow that. But I want to hear shortly from, the, from Marcus, who is on behalf of ISOC, also wearing more hats today, 
On behalf of ISOC, why is the technical community here and why is it distant from, from others? A short correction, actually. The Tunis agenda mentions the academic and technical communities. And they came into the process between the two phases of the WISIS. When we had the working group on internet governance, I remember they turned up and said, what is this all about? They talk about our job and we are not allowed to have a say. And that was in Tunis, but they were at the back of the room then, and they're deciding on our future. They don't allow us to speak, but they were allowed to speak. They were able to come in, make comments, not in the way they can do it in the IGF, but a little bit as Ambassador Fonseca explained in a UN way in between some of the segments the chair called on some representatives of the technical community to make a statement. But already that proved very beneficial. And when we started with the IGF, the technical community really bought in into the process. They saw there is value in engaging in a dialogue with other stakeholders, with civil society, with governments. It's not that they had not had these contacts as all these organizations are very bottom-up and multi-stakeholder where everybody can participate, but the IGF allowed them to meet people they might not otherwise have met, reach out to them, make them interested in their own work and activities. And so at this IGF, ICANN will have an open forum where they explain their work. The Internet Society will have an open forum. The Internet Engineering Task Force will have an open forum. So if you're interested more to learn more about the work these organizations do, please go, sit in, learn, listen, and ask questions and inform yourself. It, this has proved a very valuable platform for the Internet organizations to explain what they're doing. And it is our firm belief that policy decisions should be taken on a sound understanding of the underlying technology. You cannot come to a good policy decision if it ignores how the Internet actually works, and the IGF allows to do that. I do remember very early on when I was involved in the process, there was one leading engineer who said, how can we solve a problem like spam when politicians can't tell us what this is. So clearly no group can do it alone. They all have to talk to each other. And that's why we think the IGF is an important platform for us. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Oh, let me end with a commercial, actually. The next session will be on the role of governments, which will follow very nicely in this discussion we've had. We have various government representatives and other stakeholders who talk about how to move forward involving the uh, governments into a multi-stakeholder cooperation. Thanks. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, that was my next question. You stole me the question, but it was good. Uh, no, I just wanted to underline uh, what, what you mentioned. I think one of the particular roles of the, of the technical community, which I think everyone appreciates, is exactly explaining how the Internet works to all of us that are maybe not engineers. Well, I am the engineer, but all those that are not the engineers and uh, politicians and civil society and, and the academia even, to some extent, that are not involved in the technical aspects. While on the other hand, of course, there is a role in, in this kind of the education of the other stakeholders, like the politicians, to educate the engineers how the political processes work, and how diplomacy works, and so on. So in that sense, there is really a great value of, of the communications uh, at the IGF. Now, we have closed this part about the stakeholders, and I initially intended to open the floor for comments and questions. Unfortunately, we, are, well, we were a little bit late, and the next session is coming. But Fortunately, we have three more sessions next day, so every day next one. We have a question from Santos, which I will leave for tomorrow, if you agree. Tomorrow we'll be working in smaller groups, so it'll be, it'll be easier. And before we close the session, uh, just a brief uh, overview of the two sessions of the today. First one that Marcus mentioned is the building bridges, the role of the governments, which, uh, which is in this room just after this session, within the next five, seven minutes. I don't know, Marcus, if you want to add anything to this? Okay. Uh, and the other one that we wanted to, to uh, briefly present is the capacity building related, uh, related uh, uh, workshop. Uh, Ellen should be somewhere around. Ellen, Ellen is there. Uh, briefly, what is it going to be about? Where is it going to be? Why should people come? It's a capacity building one, so we wanted to share with everyone.
Thank you. Hello. I'm Ellen Blackler with the Walt Disney Company. We have organized a session uh, at 11 o'clock today in one of the Kintamani rooms on the second floor that is how to encourage the growth of local content. We hear a lot um, from people trying to develop their internet ecosystem to include how they can have more content available for people online. So we have organized a session that we'll be talking about the different kinds of policies that encourage con content creation. We also will be talking about a partnership we uh, have just developed with the Bandung Institute of Technology here in Indonesia to encourage uh, the development of app developers and digital media. We'll be running a uh, contest with the students at the university and we'll award a, a, a cash prize and some mentoring to uh, different digital media ideas that have been applied when people apply. So it's an example of things that can be done at the local level to encourage content creators, uh, which we believe will drive adoption of the internet. So come at 11 in the Kintamani room. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, thank you. Um, so we'll close this session. I'll just remind you about the tomorrow orientation session. It again, starts at 8 o'clock. I know it's quite early, but we'll make it. Um, tomorrow, we will start with mapping the sessions, the main sessions of tomorrow, which are internet governance principles, principles of multi-stakeholder cooperation, and then security, legal, and other frameworks. So we will try to hear what will be spoken about at these sessions and why should we visit them, if we should. And then we'll move into this group work. I hope we'll use these small table, uh, tables and, and split into a couple of groups and not to make, again, a mistake about the topics we'll cover. Uh, one group will discuss security, openness, privacy, human rights. The other one will discuss access, diversity, infrastructure, and so on. Uh, the third one will discuss uh, uh, IG4D, basically, governance, multi-stakeholder models, environment for emerging markets, and so on. And the fourth one will discuss critical internet resources, including DNS management, IP management, uh, role of the ICANN, uh, uh, registers, and so on. Uh, so I invite you to, to join us tomorrow again. Day three will be the negotiations exercise and, and simulation, quite a fun game, and then day four about what to do after the IGF. Tomorrow we'll do more questions and, and interaction. I thank you for coming today, and see you tomorrow. Thank you.